Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to Hi, everybody. Oops, I'm Chef AJ. That always Today happens. March. This is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Back by popular demand is John Kohler. He has, I think, probably more videos on his YouTube channel than anybody I've ever met in my life. And he's fabulous. I love his reviews when he does comparisons on different machines. And he's going to actually come back and do a show on that. But today he's here to talk about something he's passionate about, not only eating the healthiest greens, but growing them yourself. Please welcome back, John Kohler. I can't wait to see what you have for us today. Yeah. Thanks, AJ, for having me. I'm really passionate about gardening and growing food. I mean, as vegans, right? People know that already as a vegan or a plant-based eater, we already have the most sustainable diet on the planet because it's the lowest on the food chain. But what could be more sustainable than growing it literally steps from your kitchen in your backyard? I mean, we, this is not like, a, you know, a blue screen. This is actually my garden. I'm sitting outside in 50 degree weather for you guys. But I mean, I'd, I'd be out here working anyways. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you guys around a little bit even um, to show you guys what I'm growing. But I mean, to grow your own food is just you, you get a better connection with nature. Number one, which is a which is essential in this day and age. I mean, we're all so much inside, and a lot of you guys might be on the computer a lot. I mean, I work on a computer job for a couple hours each day, but then I'm, you know, getting out to nature, growing your own food, growing greens that literally money cannot buy, flavors and taste sensations that you cannot experience from just, you know, relying on farmers to grow the highest quality food. I mean, it's quite unfortunate, and I wish the system was set up differently. But farmers are paid by how much yield they could produce, not on the quality of the food. And this is costing many people their lives, like literally, I mean, because the quality of the food is so poor, especially when they start processing food. But even when they just grow food industrial on a big commercial farm, to me, that's a form of processing. I know my food that I'm growing here is minimally processed to the max. I add things to the soil to, you know, create higher levels of phytonutrients, phytochemicals, and have trace minerals in there, even like iodine that can be deficient in diets, you know, so I mean, I also eat seaweed for iodine, but I also supplement my garden with iodine so that the plants will uptake some of the, that iodine and other, you know, trace minerals like selenium and whatnot, um, so that I could get it and I could eat it and I could have the healthiest greens. And that's what I want for all you guys as well. well how long have you been growing your own food? Huh, <sighs> geez. So I really got into it. I mean, my YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, I have over 1,600 videos that share my whole process of getting into gardening in a larger way. I started that channel, I don't know, probably like 12 years ago now, but I've probably been growing for about 20, like in the periphery. And a lot of people have like a garden as a periphery, as a side. They might have one or two tomato plants, which I've done for many years. But until my friend, another fellow vegan, raw vegan, Don Weaver, uh, you know, really opened my eyes into how much different it could be if you grow your own. Then I went full tilt. And that's when I converted my front yard, AJ, in a standard residential tract home uh, in from a lawn to a full raised bed vegetable garden that's on my YouTube channel showing the process. And then this is my backyard garden where I have like uh, these round raised beds. If you guys could see these and I have like uh, like 20 of these round raised beds on the other side of my yard. I have a longer you know, raised beds where I grow lots of food. Wow, that doesn't, you, I mean, I bet in, you save money doing that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, the money savings is not the first and foremost, because I mean, everybody values money and all this stuff. But for me, I value quality. So I mean, if I, if I have to spend a bit more money to get some good quality food, which is quite rare, I'll do that and support local farmers in my area. I mean, I go to the farmer's markets here. But they're really, I mean, my, my backyard is a better farmer's market than the farmer's markets here in Vegas because I have a lot more food that's growing here than the farmer's markets at where they actually import a lot of the food from California. So it's not really even like good quality in my opinion, but. Yeah, that is incredible. I mean, there's nothing like just walking outside and getting dinner, is there? No, it, it's so amazing. Yeah, the quality is so important, but then I put, add things to the soil too. I mean, for me, like I almost lost my life. That's why I went raw food plant-based in 1995 many years ago and I've been on this journey to like how could I improve my diet and I mean many vegans stop it you know reading the ingredient labels and making sure there's no animal parts or products used which I totally commend and it's totally amazing but I encourage everybody out there to take it to the next level and think more about the quality and where is you know how was the food raised you know what are the nutrients in the food it's it's just because it's kale at the store doesn't mean it's automatically all right. I mean, I was in the store the other day, actually, I saw 
kale that's like you know yellowing and when kale starts to go yellow i don't know about you but i know it starts to start tasting really gross and like if you buy and eat greens from the store and you eat it and you're like oh this doesn't taste good but it's good for me i gotta eat it <laughs> more power to you but for me i mean i got dinosaur kale on the back there it's it's like totally green you pick it and it's so flavorful so delicious i've had the amazing experience to turn some people on to fresh pick greens and how much better they could taste in the store i mean many people out there have had like a tomato from the farmer's market or maybe they grew themselves versus like a tomato right now in the winter time from the store that's even certified organic it has no flavor and my greens have a lot more flavor actually i did a video you had her on recently lissa from raw food romance and actually she came to my garden and tasted 95 and i probably have about 100 now different varieties of leafy greens that i'm growing so i mean you probably also had will will be on there i won't pronounce his last name uh you know Bolshevitz. Uh, Bolshevitz. Bolshevitz. yeah thank you you're, you're the pronunciation queen um you know he talked about eating a variety of foods and like literally in my garden i grow 95 different kinds of leafy greens including herbs and things so different kinds of fibers different kinds of phytonutrients and i mean some grocery stores i go to they don't even have 95 kinds of different produce items and I have that, you know, well, I had that growing in my garden because when she came, it was like the cross between summer and uh, winter season. So I have two distinct seasons where I grow different kinds of greens. Wow. And Lori has a question. She's watching live. Do you eat everything yourself or is it too much? Do you have to maybe dry stuff or sell stuff or give stuff away? Yeah. So this is my personal garden. I don't sell anything. Uh, you know, I do pretty much use it all myself. Right. So. I'll eat a lot of it fresh. I do a lot of juicing and juicing will use up produce faster than you could say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Um, so I do a lot of juicing. I will also do, uh, you know, a blended uh, salads and uh, blended smoothies. I will also eat my greens, which should be the basis of every plant-based eater's diet, in my opinion, uh, for better health. Um, you know, every day I eat, you know, salads and soups made with my fresh picked greens. Um, and then... And then if I've extra, then I will, that's when I dry it. So I dry it, I could dry it and then powder it into green powders for the off season. Or actually my favorite thing to do is make things like uh, lettuce chips or kale chips. And basically any kind of green I could turn into kale chips by basically making a, a nut and a fruit, you know, base dressing and put it in there and then just put in the dehydrator and then dehydrate it. And then I could eat it, you know, during the summer. So like my favorite thing, like right now, is to my winter garden. And in my winter, I grow things like lettuces and bok choys and different kinds of kales. And I mean, I'll show you guys in a minute. Um, and then I'll have so much like when it comes to be April or March when it's like done and the weather starts warming up. And then I'll harvest it all, dry it all. And then I'll get to eat that over the summertime. So now I'm still eating from my garden over the summertime. So I preserve it. I mean, I don't, I mean... My goal is to eat every single green in my garden and not, I don't want to sell it because to me, like selling it would be like a waste because like that's like devaluing my hard work. <laughs> when you say dry it, do you just like literally put it in your like an Excalibur dehydrator and that's how you dry it? Well, okay. So <laughs> I dry in multiple ways and I have to be really careful about what I say because I, there was a lawsuit against me and I'm not supposed to mention a certain um, thing that I use to dry my food. So I use multiple ways of drying. Dehydration is one. I can't really talk about the other due to a lawsuit, unfortunately, but it, uh, it, it preserves more nutrients than uh, dehydration. Wow. Okay. But you do it yourself. It's a process. Absolutely. Everything is all myself in a process and it's just me and it takes, it's a lot of work. I'm not, I mean, it's growing your food, processing it and eating healthfully the way I do it. I mean, it's like, it's like a full-time job for me. So, Wow. What is your, what is your day? Like, I'd love, like, what, what is your day? Like running a, a, a garden like this? So every day is a little bit different. And the, the good thing is, you know, once everything's planted out, like this side is pretty much all planted out. So pretty much, especially this time of year, when it's winter time, winter time is actually the best time to grow food because when it's cold out and it freezes, right. The insects, they won't be in your garden because they're, they're cold blooded. They freeze. They don't, they won't, they won't mess with anything. So literally once I get this planted out, I just let the sun rise, the sun set, the automatic irrigation comes on. So literally all I have to do is walk around, make sure there's no major pest outbreaks and just wait for it to grow. And things grow a lot slower in the winter time because of the colder weather and the less sun. But my daily, 
um, thing I do is normally in the morning I'll wake up and then I'll maybe work online for a couple hours and that varies, you know, two to four hours, depending on the day. And then I'll either come out to the garden, harvest things and juice them. Or I'll usually, I'll usually do some kind of food prep. So I usually do a lot of juicing in my, for my lifestyle. And then if I don't, if I'm not doing food prep for that day, then I'll come out and walk the garden and see what I need to do. Like what projects do I need to do? Cause I'm also always filming videos for YouTube. Cause I put out three videos a week actually, which is it pales in comparison to how much you put out AJ, <laughs> but still it's, it, I've been doing this for like, I don't know, 12 years now. So it, it's a lot of work. So I'll film a video, like sharing what I'm doing in the day in the garden. Like just the other day I planted out, you guys can't probably see that here. Let me move it. Um, over on this side, I have all these fig trees that went dormant. And then on the bottoms of them, I planted also little cilantro plants, you know, to encourage more microbial um, growth in the root zone and also to have more cilantro planted um, out to grow. So then I might do a little project like that. Then by the end of the day, maybe I'm gonna sit down and take some time to eat. And then by, by nighttime, when it's five, especially because it's getting dark early, I'm inside and, and finishing up eating and then probably editing a video or, you know, watching some Netflix or something. <laughs> nice. What do you watch on Netflix? Uh, let's see. Oh, I've been watching Amazon lately and the latest show I'm watching is El Cid. Yeah, I watched like I like the dystopian kind of like the 100 was one of my favorite shows or like um, Vikings. I like the show Vikings. A lot of those like, uh, I don't know, sci fi slash, you know, whatever um, historical pieces like with swords and people's knights and all this kind of stuff. Wow. Did you like uh, Game of Thrones? I never watched that, actually. And I, I always I tried like at least three times to watch it and start with the first episode. And it just didn't suck me in like some of the other things I've watched. I tried. It was too violent. And once I saw uh, that something was going to happen to a dog, I just couldn't watch it. But people mm. praise it. And the guy in it is vegan. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. I can, I'm, I'm, what's his name? He's fabulous. Uh, Peter Dinklage. Oh, yeah. No idea. Here, let me. I'm going to pick you guys up and take you guys around the garden a little bit. Yeah. yeah and Nancy works. wants to know, what do you use for fertilizer? And Colleen, he lives in Las Vegas. Yeah. So for fertilizer, um, we'll talk about that here. But I want to show you guys a little bit. So like this is my bok choy right there my little baby bok choy and you can see there's actually some bug holes on there and that's all right we want to embrace imperfect food you know they use all these chemicals up oh, and then on this side you guys can see that's a uh, arugula growing and then beyond the arugula you can see there's some uh kamatsuna so an asian green then behind the kamatsuna is my parsley right there and then right here is i grow all red lettuces so the red lettuces are more health be beneficial than the green lettuces uh, because they have the anthocyanin pigments and also it's very important when you guys are choosing lettuce to grow or to buy try to select open head lettuces the reason why you want open head lettuces is because the sun there's more solar panels for the sun to hit so they make more nutrition than like a closed head like an iceberg or a romaine even though i know we all love the taste of romaine and the crunchiness the next of course you know i'm on a dr Furman's nutritarian lifestyle g bombs and this is basically all little baby green onions you know so there's 36 plants in there i can just come in and snip off a whole bunch you know throw them in my soup throw them in my salad oh my gosh they're so much better when you grow them yourself and then let's see, keep moving back see how this works oh and then this is another bed this is probably one of the reddest lettuces you could get this is called lola rosa lettuce and i love it just because it's so red i'm really into things that are red and purple and then over on this side you guys can see you got some uh, spinach this is like some baby spinach. And man, I got to tell you guys, like the spinach you guys buy, like in the store, like the organic, like the one pound box at Costco. I mean, a lot of people buy that. To me, that tastes so chalky and so terrible. And it's like wilted and it's like, it's like mush. Maybe if you cook it, it's probably good, but I, I only eat it raw. So it's just never really that good. But my spinach, it just tastes so much more crisp and like sweet. It, it's like so amazing how much better food could taste and then uh, let's see oh go back this is probably my favorite bed right here this is this is my um purple mizuna so look at that brilliant deep rich purple colors i mean these if i look at these uh guys they make me happy i'm just like yeah, look it's at that. So it's like it's gorgeous like i can't even imagine eating it it's so pretty <laughs> well i know yeah i mean and i love the veining if you if you look i don't know if you guys the camera's probably not that good but if you see the veining on there it's like purple but then the veins are like a nice pink color I don't know. I, lo I love that so much. 
It's amazing. All right, I think I'm running out of core. But anyways, in the back, we got the dinosaur kale there. And then over here, I got uh, like uh, bull's blood beet greens. And then, of course, some more red lettuce. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is just part of my garden. I, I'm, on, I'm on a court to make sure the quality stays good. So it's a bit more difficult to <laughs> maneuver around, but we're going to set, set it down right here. Uh, Jesse wants to know about your irrigation and what kind of water you use. Yeah, so I mean, I just use uh, city water and I filter it. And then on the, on the fertilizer, the other fertilizer question, um, I, I use primarily compost. So I make my own compost, I buy compost in, and then like everybody has a different idea what, what fertilizers. Of course, there's animal manure fertilizers and I, 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 I don't use, well, let's put it this way. It's like my goal is to not use animal manure fertilizers and that's the dominant way that most organic farms like grow food. So, I mean, people are buying organic food but they're using animal manure to grow it. So, I mean, how vegan is that? Because now literally the slaughterhouse waste products are being used to grow your vegan food. But if you grow it yourself, you can ensure you don't use any slaughterhouse waste products. I don't like to use bone or blood meal. Um, you know, those I basically don't, I, I strive to not use in my garden. And, you know, once again, if you're, if you're gardening and you're growing food, you get, you're in control. I mean, and, and really the, the most natural way to grow food is, in the forest, there's no fertilizer pixies spreading this fertilizer stuff from a bag. This is some man-made concoction and invention that we think, oh, like we think we need to take vitamins or we're going to be deficient in something. Fertilizers are like vitamins to the plants. You could give them what, you know, man thinks they need, but that's not really what they need. Like in a forest, the trees grow, the leaves drop, the leaves compost down. They create fertility. They bring in more minerals and nitrogen into the soil. There's bacteria and fungi that fix nitrogen from the, from the air that bring nutrients into the plants. You know, some of the things I use actually, very important uh, things like this. This is called azomite. And this is for the trace minerals. This is granulated natural trace minerals. It has A to Z of minerals, up to 70, 70 different kinds of trace minerals that are very important for our health but also for plant health. Some have not been researched as well. And that's why like NPK fertilizer is basically three minerals and most agronomists may put up to 16 minerals into the, in, into soil to get the plants to grow because they're just concerned about the plant's health, but they're not concerned about the human health after the plant is harvested and then eaten. And that's why I put up to 70 different trace minerals through the azomite. And then I will also add sea minerals. Um, and that'll get me up to 90 different kinds of minerals from the planet. I'll put in things like phytoplankton and kelp from the oceans. Um, and that stuff smells. I mean, it smells like the ocean. But, you know, that really gives my plants a boost. That's also the source of the iodine that I get so that my plants now have the iodine so that when I eat them, you know, I'll get small amounts of the iodine as well. Another thing that I use a lot that is really important is uh, something like this. This is called the Worm Gold Plus, and this is worm castings. Now, not all worm castings are created equal. Uh, worm castings are a source of uh, small amounts of nutrients, but more importantly, they are the biology that makes the soil food web work. It's everybody, especially after talking with Bill, Will B uh, on your show, you know, if he, if people are familiar with their microbiome and how important it is to have a wide variety of foods to feed our microbes and to maybe eat things like pomegranates that will have acromancia that'll, you know, keep our intestinal permeability like low, uh, better. So we, we're not permeable, but the same thing happens with the soil, right? There's a whole food soil web. It's very important to have these microbes because literally microbes digest our food for us. And that's what digests the food in the soil and fertilizers, you know, that you would just buy in the store for the most part, conventional fertilizers subvert this whole process. So it's very important we want to get the microbes in there as well as the organic matter. So if you have a diversity of organic matter, think of that like eating us eating a diversity of foods. You have a diversity of organic matter and then a diversity of microbes and fungi and bacteria and arthropods and all the little creatures and earthworms. They're basically digesting the organic matter, breaking that up, making it into a water-soluble form so that the plants can uptake it so that your plants can be happy. And so that's like... That's like gardening in a nutshell right there. And most people just, I just need a fertilizer, <laughs> you know, and most fertilizers, especially if you go to the, uh, you know, garden center, you're going to pick up, especially organic fertilizers. They're usually derived from, you know, chicken manure. They're just dehydrated chicken manure that you're paying a lot of money for. 
you know, so these are not the kind of products that I like to use. You know, there's many other different kinds of uh, fertilizers you could add, like kelp meal, meal, meal um, you know, alfalfa meal, soybean meal. But like to me, all those, I, I don't really even use that many of those. I might put a little bit of fertilizer in each starting hole, but my goal is to have a good system that makes its own fertilizer on its own with me just adding in the organic matter and the worm castings and well, add a, a lot of other things besides the worm castings in the rock, the soil humates, um, insect frass, which is basically insect poop, which, you know, I think is a, a lot better than using animal manures. Well, there was a question, what if the cows were grass fed, then would it be okay to use their manure? So, you know, th there's a few issues with manure in my personal opinion. Now, everybody's going to have a different opinion on that, of course. I mean, I'm not a big fan of factory feedlot manures because obviously they're being pumped full of GMO corn and soy and then also antibiotics and drugs and who knows what else. And that ends up in their poop that now is maybe may, may even have heavy metals. So if you have like your own cows and they're grass fed and they're living the pristine life, you know, like you could use the manure. But to me, like in nature, you don't see mounds of manure and vegetables growing out of them. Like to me, that's kind of like a man-made thing. Like, yeah, you may have manure in the grass, in the fields that allow the grass to grow and continue to grow. But to me, like a more natural way to do it is just, you know, use compost. And now if you want to compost some of that manure, because there aren't, there are some good, bi there could be some good biology in the manure because the bad biology, because number one, we don't want E. coli and a lot of the E. coli outbreaks from vegetables and even sprouts are from animal feces that have been contaminated with E. coli. So we want to have the, the animals have a good digestive system so we don't get E. coli contamination, but they could have also good beneficial microbes in there to some extent that could benefit your soil. So, I mean, I mean, one day I'll have a farm and I'll rescue animals. And I'll, when I have all these rescue animals, I will surely use their manure to compost it along with all my plant materials to grow my food. But otherwise, I'm not going to just go out of my way to source any kind of animal manure because it's against kind of, you know, what, I, what I'm what I want to do and, and my goals. Got it. Great. Um, are, it's somebody saying, are you eating some cooked food now? I do. I do eat some heat processed foods now. Uh, very small amounts. I still consider myself a raw foodist. I probably eat 90% raw. And you just, if people will think like cook foods, like they just think I'm just going out to McDonald's now or eating, you know, vegan, whatever muffins or cookies. Like, no, I have a video specifically where I talk about the foods I eat that are, and I like to use the word heat processed versus cooked because what people don't understand is that every different way uh, we process food, every different way we processed food is it's a process so like whether i juice it or blend it that's a process and you lose things in that process so you know when i heat process i generally only heat process in an instant pot and i will basically heat things up in instant pot and then eat it plain for the most part or add that to like a raw salad so for example my current i make i made a spaghetti this week with spiralized um different vegetables and then i i, I heat process some mushrooms in there and uh, just, uh, you know, added that to my raw meal. So I now have some cooked mushrooms in my raw meal. Now, you could eat those mushrooms raw, but I feel that it's probably more uh, better, uh, you know, for several reasons to heat process the mushrooms and eat them raw, especially larger quantities that, that might be problematic, just raw. Right. Do you grow anything other than greens people want to know, like potatoes <laughs> or anything else? Absolutely. So my channel is called Growing Your Greens and greens, I believe, are the most important nutritious food on the planet. And right now it is the winter time. So in the winter time, in the cold weather, things like potatoes, which are a summer crop, don't grow. Tomatoes don't grow. Eggplants, like most things won't grow. Like the thing I could be growing right now, well, actually I have a, a few fruit trees. So I might have kumquats on my tree right now. Actually, if you look, I mean, you guys could see that, but back there, there's a lemon tree. I think we got the lemon tree back there somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, I got a lemon tree over there with lemon, Meyer lemons that I'm waiting to ripen up. And then in the summertime, I grow peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, cucumbers, and even all kinds of other weird stuff. Right now is the time for greens. And then maybe if you had some snap peas, uh, you know, I normally grow sugar snap peas or snow peas right now because they'll do fine in the weather climate. But yeah, in the colder months, that's when I'm really going hardcore in the greens. In the summer months, 
in the desert here because it gets 100 degrees plus during the days you know the greens i still grow greens in the summertime but just not quite as many so i really love the different change of seasons and that's another thing i would encourage everybody out there is to eat seasonally you know yeah. at the grocery store it's everything's always in season you could always buy bananas you could always buy papayas you could always buy apples but you know apples are harvested in the fall so i you know one of the things that's important to me especially is to eat as much seasonally as I can. And I try to grow as much of the food as I can and eat out of my garden first before I go to the grocery store to fill in. You know, I mean, I have things like catnip and mint and oregano, and I have lots of different kinds of herbs that I, I just don't have to buy those anymore. So even if somebody doesn't want to like convert their whole yard, this is a big undertaking, you know, like I've done, I just start out with a small four foot by four foot raised bed kit that you guys could buy at a nursery or in, um, you know, big box store, or even just get some plywood and just make four sides with plywood, fill it up with some good soil from, you know, I would say a nursery would be better than, you know, going to a big box store, but just fill it up with some soil, get some transplants. That's a lot easier than seeds. The majority of my plants are from transplants. Um, because it's just a lot easier and time saving and it ensures a greater level of success because I'm not the best at, you know, starting seeds off unless I take the seeds and just throw them out and then they just come up on their own. Wow. Here's a nice comment from Stacy. Hi, uh, tell John he's been a huge inspiration since 12 years ago when I started eating plants. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad. Yeah. So do you grow any starches? Uh, yeah. So actually the other side of my garden right now, because I started implementing, adding some heat processed sweet potatoes, you know, for their beneficial fibers. And then plus for sweet potatoes, like I, I will basically only eat purple sweet potatoes because they're not as sweet because my goal isn't to get calories from cooked foods. Like maybe some people like to do. My goal is to get my calories from vegetables predominantly, then some fruit and then fill in with some different kinds of fiber. So the other side of my garden, I planted over a hundred sweet potato slips this year. And actually within the next week, I got our, I got to start digging them all up. So I'm going to have buku sweet potatoes. I should have at least a hundred pounds. Well, knock on wood of sweet potatoes that I'll be able to, you know, eat over the next, you know, several months. So that'll be really nice. How many pounds of food do you have to eat every day to get all your calories from fruits. And you, I'm sure you're familiar with the principle of calorie density. And oh, how absolutely. Food. Yeah. I mean, that's another reason why I love my greens, AJ, because you know, greens are, I mean, maybe if you're lucky, a hundred calories per pound, maybe 80 or something or less, but I have to eat a lot of calories. I have to eat a lot of food. So, I mean, I think I figured it out. Like it, it's at least like 10 to 12 pounds of food. And especially, I mean, most people in a raw food that would get their calories from fruit. So 300 calories, you know, per pound. And, you know, that's like, I don't know, five pounds of fruit is 1500 calories. And hopefully those same people are also eating equivalent amounts of pounds and vegetables. So now they got 1500 calories from fruits and 500 calories from vegetables. And that's my minimum I would recommend. I've, I had a video on this, but I think a lot of people that are into a raw diet eat way too much fruit and they just don't eat enough vegetables. So my vegetable to fruit ratio, I like to at least minimally do 50, 50, 50. So if I'm going to eat, you know, 500 calories of vegetables, I'm going to eat 500 calories of fruit. And so my vegetable ratio is like, I try to keep that around like 800 calories from vegetables, which is challenging. You know, I mean, if you cook vegetables, it makes it a lot easier. I don't cook them. I would rather, I would rather not cook vegetables and I'd rather juice them personally. I mean, yes, juicing removes some, but not all the fiber but also it, it makes some of the vegetables more absorbable. So I could, uh, you know, get higher levels of different beta carotenes and probably other kinds of polyphenols and nutrients in my blood, but, and, but you remove some of the fiber. So it concentrates it down like cooking wood. Cooking concentrates down and breaks down the fiber so you can eat more. Juicing does the same thing, but removes some of the fiber, but you, there, there's a pro and con to each one, you know, but I would choose juicing before I chose to cook food to get calories. And so, for example, today I already had, uh, like, let's see, 30, 40 ounces of juice. So I had turmeric, pomegranate, ginger, um, clove, black pepper juice. That was like eight ounces. And then I had like 32 ounces of green juice, which is uh, romaine lettuce, um, celery, uh, cucumber, and then kale for my garden, kale and collard greens for my garden. So, I mean, that juice, just one quart of juice is about four pounds of vegetables right there. So that's about, you know, roughly 400 calories. 
you know, just in my juice alone that I've had today. And I'll drink maybe one more juice, have some fruit, and then have like a big kind of my vegetable salad meal. Do you do any dried fruit at all, either for flavor or condiment or dressings? <laughs> Yeah, so dried fruits have gotten me in trouble. And I will, I will be the say, uh, first to say that they have gotten me in trouble because they are a concentrated food. Al although they're natural and they are fruits, you know, they have a lot more calories than the fresh fruits. So my go I've been, uh, I, I, I'll eat a few more extra dried fruits, especially if I haven't eaten enough during the day. And that's my sign that like, hey, John, you haven't eaten enough during the day. You're going for the dried fruits because they're easy. <laughs> right. I know. I don't. I tend not. They, they're like candy. And I tend they to are. like when I travel and I can't get enough food, calories, that's when I use them. This is really like I, I'm I can't get enough calories. So now I will eat some dried fruit. Yeah. So my goal, though, is I'm because I'm, 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 I did this for a while. Then somehow I got switched back to eating dried fruit. My goal is to eat more dried vegetables. So I'm currently working on that process to eat more you know, freeze dried things like, uh, you know, sweet potatoes, uh, freeze dried cauliflower, freeze dried um, corn and organic, of course, and freeze dried uh, peas. So that will get me off some of the fruit that'll be less calor calorically dense because it won't have the sugar and also it'll be good fiber. And I think that's a better step in the right direction for when I, you know, still feel that I need to eat something that's still going to be quite healthy for me. Right. Because I, I do see like a lot of the raw fooders, it's, it's mostly a fruitarian diet. Yeah. And I personally don't believe that's good for the long term. I mean, it might work for short term and it's great, you know, but I think it's to the extent of what, what are you leaving out so that you can eat so much fruit? Yeah. So here's a couple of great questions. One is from Lori. Do you need to still supplement with B12 since you're growing your own food? And <laughs> That's a good question. So I supplement with B12 and I, I would recommend to people that they continue to submit with B12, you know, I mean, and I, I've researched and yes, I've researched this and this is very interesting. I've researched the specific microbes that actually poop out B12, you know, and then I've added those to my garden to, you know, make sure that I'm going to have the microbes that are making the B12, but I'm not going to rely on that because if that system is not working for some reason, I'm not going to rely on my garden. But, you know, in nature, we, sh we should be able to do this along with getting clean water that's been quote unquote contaminated with B12. Um, you know, that's should how it should be. I did have a friend, a longtime friend who was a gardener who never washed his produce, who, you know, probably didn't go to the extent that I do to add microbes to the garden. And when he got his B12 tested, he was deficient. You know, so just because your gardener doesn't mean you're going to get B12. And of course, everybody's a bit different and I'm not the expert on all these things, but I grow the best garden I can. Hopefully I'm getting some B12 from that. I take a supplement, but also you could look into things like lentine powder or the duckweed powder, which is said to have B12. And there's a few other sources of potential B12 that I also eat, but nonetheless, I still supplement as well. Terrific. And Colleen says, what do you use, if anything, to keep the bugs away? <laughs> so that's a good question. So here's the thing. So the ideal situation for bugs in your garden is like for us, right? How do we keep the virus or a cold away from us? If you're eating McDonald's and eating a junk food diet, you're more susceptible to getting sick and being sick. And I know a lot of you guys out there who went whole food plant-based, nutrient-dense, you used to get colds and be sick like all the time. And now that you started eating healthy, you're like, wow, I barely ever get sick. I have friends that are raw foodists that claim they never get sick. I, I rarely ever get sick nowadays with my diet, but you know, on occasion it happens. And that's the same thing with our plants. You know, when you get a headache, the goal is to like, oh, let's take an aspirin to get rid of the headache. And to me, pesticides and spraying things on the plants is like taking an aspirin to get rid of our headache because it's not solving the issue at hand. And the issue at, at hand is, you have weak plants that are attracting bugs and disease. Like we would get sick if we're not eating healthy. Your plants will get sick if they're not eating healthy as well. They'll be more apt to getting and attracting bugs because here's the thing. And this is like, this goes crazy. And when I learned all this stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, this, this is totally insane. So people don't understand that if you have good soil and you have a good soil microbiome, you have all the nutrients in the soil, your plants will create more complex proteins. They did a test with green beans. Green beans, the same looking green bean from the store versus like a homegrown in ideal situation could have 50% more protein. So it has like twice as much protein as a green bean from the store that's just being grown conventionally than a homegrown green bean. So now you could literally eat half as much food to get 
twice as much protein. And when you have more complex proteins and when your protein levels are higher in your plants, it makes your plants resistant to bug damage because bugs cannot digest complex proteins like we can. They could only digest simple amino acids. So we really want to create a better soil health so that we have better plant health so that they protect themselves from the bugs and diseases naturally. And that's how nature worked for a thousand years. There's no like, you know, whatever pesticide pixies that go around and spray plants for bugs. I mean, in nature, like, I mean, there'll be an outbreak occasionally with bugs and stuff. And also too, I mean, trying to grow things, you know, climate appropriate. So when we try to grow things not climate appropriate, you know, then the bugs could come. And so I try to grow climate appropriate plants, choose the right plants for my climate zone, choose the plants that don't attract bugs. You know, I had a, a roommate that would just go around my garden, and just pick the plants that did have the bugs because she didn't like to wash them off until I kind of got my soil engine working a little bit better so that I could do higher quality. The other thing I'll say is that the winter time right now is the best time because I basically have zero bugs because they don't they don't survive in the cold weather. Um, in the summertime, you know, I'll, I'll use manual controls, you know, so I'll pick off bugs. I will bring in beneficial insects. So I try to like think about like how would nature do it versus how would man do it? Man would do it by spraying some chemicals because it's easy. How would nature do it? You know, well, I, I bring in beneficial insects. So I bring in every year I buy praying mantis eggs on eBay. And then I, I get sent like 50 praying mantis eggs. I put them all around my garden. They hatch. And then now they could be non-vegan in my garden because they're eating all the, all the, all the pests that I, now I don't get to deal with. I don't have to spray it off the kill because the praying mantises, they get to eat them and they get to take care of them. And that's just nature at work. Wow. So you know, there's a lot, there a lot of different techniques, but, you know, and for the most part, I don't really worry about it. I mean, there's sometimes like I'll spray water. So I make some non more non-toxic ways of dealing with pests is I could spray wa high pressure water to blast aphids off the plants. Sometimes I'll smush it with my fingers. I have a high pressure. I made a video using a high pressure air gun, which is probably the most vegan because you can just basically bro blow bugs off your plants with high pressure air to just get them to go somewhere else you know and that's that's a really thing for me you know trying to like when i was as i well let's say i'm plant-based i don't not, not like to necessarily use the word vegan because that means a lot more than just eating uh plants and i know some people really get deep into the philosophy but really when i became a gardener i saw like wow how am i going to deal with all these bugs am i going to pick every snail off and like some vegan friends i have they're going to pick the snails off and toss them over the over into the neighbor's yard or relocate them somewhere or, you know, what am I going to do? Because either they're eating or I'm eating. And then each of us have to make a choice on what we are willing to do so that we could have food. And if we're not willing to do it, then, of course, then we just pay somebody else to basically kill all pests on your organic food or your conventional food that you're growing. At least in this way, I have the control to figure out, you know, what are going to happen to my snails or other bugs in my garden. If I want, I mean, I have a friend that comes over to relocate the tomato hornworms in the, in the, in the summertime that she'll see from my garden. But then I'm like, well, wait, you relocated them just down to the other area. Like, do they even have food that they're going to eat? So I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, you mentioned the microbiome and Lori's saying that she bets you have a, a stellar microbiome from the way you eat. I would hope so. I hope to get a microbiome test pretty soon. I mean, of all the things, I mean, that's why I incorporated one of the reasons why I started incorporating some heat processed foods to expand the varieties. Cause as a raw foodist, you might just leave out whole categories of foods, right? You won't pretty much eat, you know, potatoes. Like I'll eat purple potatoes. You won't eat some grains. I mean, I'll, I'll cook some rice. I mean, you could eat some certain kinds of rice like sprouted or bloomed. And of course, besides just eating a wide variety is also growing your own and now getting the indigenous microbes that are just existing in your environment. And, you know, I spray on different kinds of compost teas and different kinds of microbes on my plants. And then also when I eat my plants, you know, they're, they're, those are guys are going to get into me. So, I mean, I, I hope I have a good microbiome. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, met, I, I didn't meet you, but I saw you, gosh, over 10 or 15 years ago with that, you know, that show in Orange County, I, I, the, you know, the Expo, Expo yeah. West, I think Expo it's called. West. Yeah. And you look younger than you did then. So whatever <laughs> you're doing, it's working. I can tell you that because you're, it's like you're aging backwards. Well, I was probably eating too much fruit then. <laughs> And then you could see more wrinkles in my eyes because of crossly because too much fruit. <laughs> Person, well, that's my personal opinion. I mean, I know some fruitarians might get mad, but I mean, that's, I mean, I think I was eating way too much sugar, even as a fruitarian back then, but 
you know, wow. to each their own. Elizabeth says, do you eat any beans or legumes? I do actually. So you could technically, if you want to be raw, you could sprout some beans and legumes. I mean, I th- did you have like, um, what's the guy, Doug Evans on? I think you had Doug. I had him on, yeah. 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 So he's the sprouting lentil king, and I want to go and visit him and see how he's doing raw food, sprout based diet, which on some levels is totally amazing. Um, so you could sprout certain lentils, but certain beans, if you sprout them and eat them, you, you could die. <laughs> of course. So like these days, I will actually heat process some beans uh, to include in small amounts just for variety in my diet. I do not have a a bean based diet. My vegetable my diet is vegetable based with addition of some amounts of beans because of their health properties and health benefits. And actually my favorite beans are Urad Dal, which are the basically like black lentils and they have higher omega-3 content. Plus of course they're black. So they contain the anthocyanins. Cool. Let's see. I just, Oh, Kathy says, how, what size is your garden? Like how much square footage is it? You know, I never measured it. It's just whatever a standard tract home garden is. I could tell you how many beds I have. So you, you can see these round raised beds here. I have like a 20, I think, is it 20 or 24? These round raised beds are their four foot round raised beds. So you could calculate the space. And then I have uh, three four foot by 16 foot beds and two eight foot by four foot beds. And then I have random like, you know, like against the wall there, you could see I have all these fig trees with pots and lined up. And then you could see all the little um, cilantro plants I have planted. And then I have like a, a one foot wide by 12 foot long bed and another random bed. So, I mean, like really both my places I grow in like a standard residential tract home, how much space a normal person would have. And that's, I think really one of the joys that I've had, you know, I don't live on a farm where people think, Oh, I can't do that, John. I don't live on a farm. So I just live in a tract home, like probably most of you guys out there. And I make the most of it by growing in every possible square, you know, foot I can. I mean, if you come, I don't really have visitors to my garden, but you come here you're like, you're going to be, like it, it's hard to walk <laughs> because it's just meant for growing and me getting enough walkway space to, to get through to, you know, manage and, and deal with all my plants back here. John, what about people that live in apartments? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily recommend growing like vegetables like I'm growing because, you know, here's the thing. Like I plant like a lettuce plant. It could take 90 days to mature. Once a lettuce, one, if you plant one lettuce plant, it takes 90 days to grow and then you harvest and you eat it. It's gone in one day. Or, or like one meal or less than a meal because I need probably more than one head of lettuce to eat, right? So it's not really an efficient use of space to try to grow lettuce or something. Maybe some tomatoes or something because cherry tomatoes, you'll get a lot more. But I would recommend for people in an apartment or uh, you know that don't have land to grow, number one is try to find a community garden. Many areas might have a community garden where you could adopt some land and pay a monthly fee to gr- grow outside in a garden that you would visit you know once a week i see a lot of people have community gardens and then they might go in the beginning of the season then they kind of uh, lull off and lose interest which is sad um so that's number one and then number two is i would say honestly grow sprouts or microgreens if you live inside that's the best way you could grow some food yourself because homegrown food in my opinion is the best food you could source the specific seeds you want you could use the filtered water you want you could add the different nutrients you want. I'm going to currently um, looking into using some different soil mediums to grow microgreens to increase their growth and nutrition. You could also put in things like, you know, uh, kelp, like kelp in with your sprouts or, you know, uh, liquid kelp in with your sprouts or your microgreens to, you know, get some additional trace minerals. You could also use ocean solids in your sprouts and microgreens to like have at least have them have the ability to uptake up to 70, 70 to 90 different minerals as well. Well, here's an interesting question that I've always wondered myself. What is the difference between freeze-dried vegetables and dehydrated vegetables? <laughs> so is the, the process. The process is completely different. So the process on dehydration is based on dehydration. You take your vegetables, you put it on a tray. There's a fan and there's a heating element. So the heating element is kind of like many of you guys might have a little portable space heater. The dehydrator is basically a space heater that doesn't go that hot. And it basically blows hot air over the vegetables. The hot air going over the vegetables will slowly evaporate the moisture off the vegetables at a slow rate. Um, you know, this might be good because maybe it doesn't get too hot. So you're preserving enzymes. But the data and the research and the science shows that if you're dehydrating the, you know, the, the moisture out of the food at a slow pace, you're, you're basically going to lose more antioxidant content 
And to me, enzymes are important. I'm not going to say they're not, but to me, antioxidant content is way more important and phytonutrient content is way more important than enzymes ever are. And if you're eating dehydrated food for your enzyme content, you know, I mean, I, 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 there's other things I'd eat for enzyme content, like sprouts have a lot more enzyme content, or I mean, I take enzyme supplement too. All right. So that's the dehydration basically works by blowing. And then, oh, and then here's the thing in the winter time right now, especially you guys have those little portable space heaters, you'll notice your skin is drying out a lot faster because it just basically dehydrates things. Right. And I mean, whatever it, once you get the moisture out, then it'll store because now the mold won't get it and all this stuff. Now freeze drying works by a different process entirely altogether. There's no, there's no fans. It, 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 there's no heat. Well, there is a little bit of heat. There's no major heat. So how freeze drying works is first you, it freezes the food. You got to freeze the food to like sometimes minus 40 or 50 degrees. So it's super cold. The best is to freeze the food slowly so that what, as the free, as the food freezes slowly, it basically blows open the cell walls, right? Now the cell walls are blown open, but now it's frozen. So you lock in the nutrients. That's why they say sometimes frozen food is healthier than the fresh food because it's locked in the nutrients and, and it's not going to degrade any further, right? So once you freeze the food, then you put it in the, the freeze dryer. The freeze dryer could freeze the food also. And then once it's frozen, then it sucks a vacuum on it. And you know, AJ, I'm into vacuum blending and using vacuum and to do things without oxygen because in oxygen, that's when oxidation happens and, you know, things happen. So under vacuum, right, you're not getting any massive oxidation occurring and the antioxidants loss that you are in dehydration with the fan blowing over it. There's no fan in there. So what happens is it's frozen and now there's a vacuum on it and now it heats up the tray gently. So some freeze dryers could heat up the tray to like 115 degrees. So it still stays raw. But at the same time, when the heat is applied to the frozen food under vacuum, right? Water could only be water. There's three forms of water, right? It's uh, it could be liquid, solid, or gas. And so when you freeze the food, it's under vacuum, and now you heat it up a little bit. The water's solid inside the food, and then when you when under vacuum, it won't ever turn into a liquid. It'll only turn into the gas. So the water literally sublimates out as a gas, and then collects to the freeze dryer um, in, in the freeze dryer machine on the sides. So now you've supplemented all the water out. It leaves the texture perfect. So if you've ever bought like freeze-dried mangoes, that's one of my favorites at Trader Joe's. They're dangerous because that's like, I could binge eat those guys and crack. gain a lot of weight. It's like crack, but I mean, it's just mangoes. Um, but, but they keep high levels of antioxidant nutrients because it's done in our vacuum and it keeps the food texture. It makes a better food texture actually for raw food. It's just the best food texture in my opinion, because it's kind of like gives you like a bread or cookie like texture and it keeps the majority of the nutrients. Now there is one better way of drying food than freeze drying. It's called refractance window drying. Uh, there's no current home units available to do refractance window drying, but I've heard some companies are working on that and that's a whole different process. Cause I'm all about, you know, for me, it's about the process. Like how do we process food the least amount possible so that I can have the most nutrients as possible. I mean, that one of the ways is by gardening and growing your food. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm changing the process of the food system so that I could have it benefit me. And then also once I harvest my food, how can I process it minimally to keep the majority of the plant phytonutrients in there so that I get the benefits from. Nice. People are saying they wish you were their neighbor. Just, they just <laughs> come over and uh, grab stuff. Uh, <laughs> no, says no, no, I would get them to, I would teach them how to do it themselves because I want every backyard in the country to look like mine. And actually that's why I've dedicated so much of my life to have like over 1600 videos on YouTube dedicated to teaching people how to grow their own food. <laughs> yeah. Monique says you're so knowledgeable about planting and gardening. Do you do anything indoors? Like do you, do you sprout indoors? I do. I do rarely sprout. I mean, I, I need a, I need a better half. Hopefully that I'll be able to do all the sprouting and microgreens because you know, I'll, I'll sprout a few things here and there, but honestly, I kill indoor plants. <laughs> like they don't do good for me because I'm always so ADHD doing all these other projects. And I mean, my outside garden is so easy because literally I get the plants in there. The irrigation comes on as much as it needs to. The sun comes out and I don't have to deal with it. Indoor plants to me, it's a lot more maintenance. <laughs> you know, some, I could deal with some sprouting. I'll sprout some buckwheat. I'll bloom some wild rice. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to do some broccoli sprouts pretty soon and try to set up a system so that it's more automated so that I don't have to do much work because like I could, 
I could deal with planting the plants and letting the irrigation system come on because I look like that's it's like literally like all the work I've done to these spinaches here. I've planted them, the irrigation comes on, I maybe sprayed them with some like um some amendments and stuff, some compost teas and whatnot, and some soil humates. And then the sun comes out and they grow inside, man. You gotta give them the light, you gotta give them the water, you gotta give them everything. And I'm just just not good at that. <laughs> so. Lori says, what, what do you put on your greens? Do you put any particular kind of dressing on? Oh, when I make my salads? Yeah. So my favorite way to eat greens, honestly, AJ, is I'll walk around the garden and just pick them and eat them because my greens are so flavorful, right? You don't need any dressing. They're so sweet and delicious. Like, actually, I have a video. With, uh, Lisa, I put it on my Growing Your Greens YouTube channel. She tastes like not all 95 different kinds of greens. And she's like, I asked her at the end, like, what's your favorite ones? And one of the ones she said was her favorite was the spinach. And she's like, I had no idea spinach could taste that good. And I mean, yeah, so I could walk around my garden, and just snack on greens. Also, too, I just I just love eating plain greens. So but I don't always eat like that. No, I always I make dressing. So um, my dressings are always like a usually a fruit or vegetable based dressing with some nuts, seeds, herbs and spices. So, for example, I just made a video where I spiralize a whole bunch of different. I, I, I spiralized purple sweet potato, zucchini, and jicama. That actually, that was a fun one to do with a special spiral slicer. And then I had that, and then I harvested a bunch of greens from my garden, and then I made I made a, a dressing or a sauce out of it was a, like like four containers of little baby cherry tomatoes, and then I put in some flax seeds, some walnuts, some. Um, some cashews. I put a little bit of low sodium miso. I put in some Italian seasoning. I put in some dehydrated bananas to add a little bit of sweetness. Um, and then some other herbs and spices. And I blended that up under vacuum. And so like that, that's, oh yeah, I've got the sweetener in there. Yeah. So, I mean, something like that. I mean, so that's what I mean in this week because I do meal prep where I'll, I'll like harvest a big batch of stuff and like make enough for seven days and I'll make it all and then pack it in vacuum under vacuum in jars and I'll have it in my fridge. Nice. And Joe right. says, what about rabbit manure? Some folks say it can be added directly to the garden without composting. That is true. So, um, you know, so here's the thing for me. So for me personally, I don't have rabbits currently. I have seen places that do add rabbit manure to the garden, but here's the thing, like what happens is where okay where are the microbes going to break down the manure or whatever organic matter it is whether it's manure or not right they could break it down in the garden right or they could break it down in a compost pile before it gets in the garden so for me it's like i do juicing because it is it, it, it pre-digests my food for me so i could have uptake it easily like for me if i had rabbits i would compost their manure first because now that manure that's been composted is more broken down and more bioavailable for the plants to absorb the nutrients from so that'd be my choice of course everybody could do what they want to do and i mean it's commonly known that i mean to me it just doesn't look super pretty to have like little rabbit pellets all by the bottom of your your vegetables growing you know but that's just me personally but you are just so passionate about this i just love your enthusiasm <laughs> Thank you. It's bad. And uh, you, you did mention this, but sometimes people come in late. But first, I want to I want to wish Amy a happy birthday. She's watching live today. Happy birthday, Amy. I want to thank Sherry Likes Fruit for her super chat donation and to thank Angela for hers yesterday. But I was too nervous to ring the bell in front of Dr. McDougall. I, I guess she's asking what percentage of fruit you eat or how many pieces of fruit or how many pounds of fruit you eat each day. Oh, me? Yeah. So my goal it, it varies. You know, my goal since I've been on this more recent track, you know, I have videos on my OK Raw YouTube channel that I talk about my diet and you can see what I eat in a day. And I guess in that video, I probably had a couple of vegetable juices, you know, I might have a, like a root juice, like made around carrots and beets. So that's a good number of calories that come from that. Then my green juice. And then I'll have like, you know, I don't know about, I don't know, up to, well, right now I got persimmons. So I'm eating like up to 10 persimmons, small persimmons are like small size up to 10 a day, you know, and then I might eat some berries in addition. But every day is different. You know, sometimes I got ripe stuff that I need to eat, then I'll eat a little bit more fruit and not as many vegetables. But my goal is, to, you know, just eat more vegetables and eat less fruit a as my general rule. Not to say that fruits are bad, but over overeating any kind of food. If you if your diet is bean based and eating 90 percent beans, I don't think that's good. You know, so we want to really, really want to try to get as much variety in this as we possibly can and not limit any one thing to the extent that it 
they say, well, remove another food from your, from your diet, you know, so you could have greater diversity in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, BC wants to know what kind of juicer did you use today for your juice? Maybe when you come back, you were scheduled in April. Maybe that's when we can talk about the different machines you use for different reasons and the ones you like the best. Right. So today's juice, what I made, I use was the, well, I use two methods because I had two different juices. So one juicer, my juices are a process. So two days ago, I made pomegranate juice. So I juice like a gallon of pomegranate juice and I use the Santa 727 to make pomegranate juice. And I vacuum saved that. And the next day I took that vacuum saved pomegranate juice. And I basically put like two pounds of uh, turmeric in there and then vacuum blended that and then put it through a nut milk bag and wrung it out. And then I added ginger juice that I'd previously made with the Santa juicer um, to make that juice. And then my green juice, I use the Nama J2 juicer just because it's like way easier. I made two gallons of green juice yesterday and the Nama just allows me to batch it and it's just done so much. It, it, it allows me to have other time to focus on other things and keep putting stuff into the juicer. So the, yeah, the three main best juicers right now are Santa 727, Nama J2, and Vacuum Blending, which would be like the Dynapro Vacuum Blender plus the Alexa's Nut Milk Bag. And I'll have a video on that for the new year because those are my favorite, three favorite juicer types right now based on the latest technology. Very cool. Let's see. Karen says, any advice for a newly established lemon tree that has never had a flower? I heard you need to fertilize them and prune them. Should I try that before removing it? I never recommend removing trees. I, you guys probably can't see, but I have a lemon tree back over there. I think you guys could see that. But basically, I got it from Costco. That probably wasn't the best idea because I, I, I later learned that it was treated with neonicotinoids, which is not good for the insects. But nonetheless... And all I ever did was I put, I basically up potted it into a 15 gallon pot because it came in a five gallon pot. And I, I just continued to add nutrients to it. And this last year it had like five lemons. This year it has like 13. I haven't pruned it. Like, I think a lot of times people prune things because of, because of their needs and their wishes. Like to me, I let a lot of my plants go natural and maybe some ar ar arborist would kind of like cringe because like my trees grow crazy, but like, we prune them to what we want because they just literally want to grow and get more sun. And so for me, for that lemon, like I would really say, look at the microbiome of your lemon tree. Like when I planted that lemon tree, I, I doused it with mycorrhizae, which, you know, um, colonizes the root zone, which is, you know, it's like us having, if we take antibiotics and we wipe out our microbiome, we're going to be, have poor health. We're not going to digest our food as well. Like most people have take no consideration to the soil microbes um, when planting, when planting fruits or vegetables and especially for trees, the fungal dominated, uh, microbes are so important for the fruit trees. So like I put in like Alaskan humus, which is high in fungal counts, which is very important for the trees, you know, and the high carbon ratio. So, I mean, it's hard to say like, do this cause I'm not a master gardener. Like to me, I just got the five gallon <laughs> lemon. I put in a, in a bigger pot. I added, it made a good soil mix. And I just top it off with compost and um, compost teas and different amendments that I use. And it's grown great. And it's actually, that's kind of like in full sun. And then in the summertime, it basically really didn't like the heat here. But nonetheless, it's still produced, you know, over a dozen lemons, just being in a little 15 gallon pot. That's so I'd, so say, cool. I'd say work on the microbiome, you know, like how can you better the microbiome for your plant? Because that, I think that's, a lot of trees, I mean, a lot of the bag soils out of the big box store, I think are just garbage. And a lot of the bag soils and things that people add to the, especially the trees are bacterial based, even to their garden. And we really need to get some fungi. I mean, we should all be eating mushrooms for our health, <laughs> which are, you know, fungi, but we also need to get the fungi into the soils. And that's, our, that's, and that's particularly hard. Not many gardeners talk about this. That's like, I think next level stuff. And I have videos where I visit a place out in spring, Texas, nature's way resources that makes the best comp composted fungal dominated soil but uh adding earth good earthworm casting could also add that but i'd say let's let's see how we can you know instead of just having a quick fix fertilizer how can we reinvigorate the soil and bring the balance of microbes i, I guess would probably be my answer yeah there's a few questions what do you do with the leftover pulp from your juices good question so it depends on, well, the, all of it goes in my compost alley. So I literally have a compost alley with like eight different composters that I'm using to like compost all my food scraps 
to turn it into garden soil that will then feed my garden next year. That's number one. And so depending like when the pulp comes out of the juicer, depending if it's wet or not, sometimes I'll use like a pure juicer and like it's like a Norwalk to press out the extra juice. And sometimes like yesterday, I was too lazy to do that. So I put it in a pre in, in, in Alexa's press cloth bag. And so I squeezed out the juice out of my hands, which was not quite as efficient. But a lot of times, like in the olden days, I would like let pulp that was wet just go into the compost. But nowadays, I'm, I'm really more religious about like getting it more dry to extract every last bit of goodness out of that. Some people might like, you know, cook with their pulp and all these things, which is great because it's a good source of fiber. But to me, after I extract all the phytochemical the majority of the phytochemicals and phytonutrients to me that fiber is not quite as valuable as other kinds of fiber so for example i think a bean fiber or sweet potato fiber or flax fiber would be far more beneficial than just trying to get more vegetable fiber there's there's doc documented scientific studies on how different fibers react for us differently and not to say that vegetable fiber is not important but i eat plenty of vegetables <laughs> already so you know the fiber you're not getting is the fiber you need the most <laughs> Right. Oh, that's interesting. That is, that's, that's probably true for all foods, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, you are just, you just, it's just, you're just so inspiring. I mean, it's just, I, I, I'm not raw. I, I eat as many salads and fruits as I can, but I just, I'm just in awe of you guys that can do this and for do it for so long and not be freezing cold and just maintain the glow. It, it, oh, it must work because everyone, I mean, I, whenever I talk to people that are high raw or all raw, they're, they're very, they really love their diet as much as I love mine. So there must be some, I, I always say, I want to try it, but gosh, John, I'm so cold all the time. I mean, the, I, I think that like, you know, heat processed foods that are warm don't necessarily make us warm. I think, I mean, that was a, something that I learned about when I got into raw foods, actually back in San Francisco, really back in the 1990s with Giuliano and his raw food restaurant. Way is back he in the still day. around? I remember him from LA. Is he still around and is he still raw? I think he's still around. I think he's still raw. I have no idea. But anyways, back then I learned that like, you know, because I, I went through that. I experienced the cold, the coldness of the raw foods. And until I stuck with it for a while, my body, I think what I would say is recalibrated into like just being fine with being cold sometimes. And then also, you know, my body will maybe generate more heat on its own. I don't know, but that's just me personally. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't really know, but I don't think we need heated foods to keep us warm necessarily. Right. Do you have any pets? I have a, a dog named Oakley. Yeah. He's, he's a, uh, he doesn't like being outside in the winter time. He's like snuggled up in his blanket right now sleeping. Oh, pets. What, what do you feed your pet? So yeah, I feed him. So I, I don't feed him entirely vegan. So I know some vegans might be mad at me. At, at I'm same that. here. Same here. I think, you know, but at the same time, I don't feed him raw carnivore either because I don't think that's healthy either. So he does it. So here's the thing. Oakley eats basically what I eat. And I have a video on YouTube, you know, what I feed my dog. And it's not, you know, the raw animal food diet. And it's not vegan. It's somewhere in between, you know. It's maybe like a uh, pegan. I don't know. <laughs> Paleo and vegan. So what he eats is he eats what I eat. You know, I'm lazy. I don't like want to make, I don't want to go out of my way to like, I used to cook him like beans and rice and the whatever the recipes for dogs that you'd find online and i'm like you know that's just too much work so basically i make nutrient dense plant-based meals that are raw and that's what he eats if i cook a sweet potato he'll get some he'll get probably more sweet potato than i eat because i don't really want that much but he seems to love it um so he'll eat what i eat so like he got like uh, my he gets my soups and my salads and then when he goes outside to go to the bathroom not when he stays inside because sometimes he's been a bad boy lately especially with the colder weather, he gets lazy. He doesn't want to go outside in the cold and he'll like go to the bathroom in the house, which is not cool. So when he goes outside the house, then he comes in and he always will get either freeze-dried salmon or freeze-dried liver treats. Nice. And so that's basically the extent of his meat for treats. And then on occasion, like I get like um, no, no salt added in water, only sardines from Trader Joe's for like $1.50. So like maybe once a month, he'll just eat three sardines, just the whole, the whole package once a month, you know, and he, he loves that. But most of the time he's eating nutrient dense, you know, um, nutritarian plant based what I'm eating because I'm just lazy. And that's why he just eats what I eat. Mostly, mostly plants. What kind of pup is he? And does he appear on any of your other videos? Yeah. So Oakley, the min pin. So he's a miniature pincher. 
And he, um, let's see, I just posted his picture on Instagram because uh, we went to the, we went to the date farm with uh, actually Lissa and Nate from Raw Food Romance over the weekend. And uh, he went on a nice hike. He had a wonderful time. And he has actually his own Instagram page at Oakley the Min Pin. He doesn't have a lot of pictures on there. <laughs> but I'm he's a cute little guy. He's, he's going to be 11 in six days. He looks like a little young guy. Oh my God, he's adorable. I just, I'll, I'll post his Instagram page. That is, so, he's adorable. That's so funny that he doesn't want to come out in the cold. Yeah, no, he, he doesn't, he hates the cold. <laughs> well, he's a, he's a dog after my own heart. Well, I cannot wait to have you back because you just, you're so knowledgeable about everything that has to do with machines and composting and growing. And so you're just really, a, really, I consider you an expert on all this stuff. Oh, one question came in from Claudia about freeze drying. Is there a machine you recommend for people that want to start freeze drying? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't talk about any machines or freeze drying because of a lawsuit that I was involved with. But uh, I could tell people to do an Internet search. And that's about all I could say about that, unfortunately. Wow, that's just I'm so sorry about that. But uh, yeah, but freeze drying is it, they're generally much more expensive, those machines than, say, even a dehydrator. Oh, they're like 10 times more expensive. Yeah. Or more. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. So it's not well, for the faint at heart. Yeah. And, and they're pretty big. Yes. Yeah. Well, Colleen, you, you, if you'd love to have John back again, he is scheduled for April 9th. I remember that because this might happen to be my wedding anniversary. So uh, that will be my anniversary present to have him back. And I really would love to ask you about like, what's the best spiral? You know, I mean, you're, this is your opinion, you know, the best spiralizer, best blender, you know, the machines that we use best, best one to make ice cream. That's the most important, actually. What so makes frozen fruit sorbets, I'll tell you that one is the pure juicer is the one I like to use the most because it's easy to clean all stainless steel. And it just gets a nice texture. I mean, other than that, I mean, I'd maybe use a champion with a blank plate or even a Yonana's machine. Yeah, I use the champ. But I got to tell you, it's really because of you that I got the Nutri Milk. And that thing is a great machine. I hardly use it to make milk anymore. I use it as a food processor because it's just so much it's, more powerful. I love the tines that scrape. Yeah, scrape down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that was just really, I was Googling it. And then your video came along and I'm like, it seems so unbiased. And it was like, you know what? I'm going to get this one because it includes the pulp and the fiber. So thank you for the work you do it's really wonderful oh it's my pleasure i want to know what's best and i want to be able to share that with others because like you know i've been on this constant quest and battle to figure out what's the best way i could do things and unfortunately you know i seem to be quite unique in the plant-based movement because i grow my food i'm trying to optimize that and i'm trying to optimize the equipment in the ways i process food which unfortunately not 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 many people talk about they just say eat the right foods and you'll be good no matter how you cook it as long as you get it in you you got to add sugar salt to it and, you know, <laughs> I don't think, I think everybody, you know, but everybody's at a different place. And exactly. when they first enter, it, it's not always, it's, it, you don't want to always set the, cause I'm like you, I, but sometimes if the bar set too high, when the people yeah, first come agree. in, they're like, forget about this. So yeah. yeah. But, people but can the, think what I'm doing, like, I'm not even going to grow anything. Cause it's like John's converted his whole yard and does all, and it's, and then they do nothing, which is, I think, completely sad. So yeah, one step at a time. That's why I encourage people. You want to start gardening, start off with a small four foot by four foot raised bed gardening. Look up Mel Bartholomew square foot gardening, or of course, watch my videos on YouTube at Growing Your Greens. Or if you want to learn more about my raw foods, plant-based diet, and learn about the best spiralizer that I just tested, that was the last video I posted. That's at OK Raw, and I have a YouTube channel dedicated to testing all the machinery um, at Raw Foods or my Discount Juicers YouTube channel, which actually after this video or after our interview, I'm going to post my next video comparing the Nama J2 and the Huram H200, which has been asked for by a lot of people. We posted all the links. You have three distinct YouTube channels. Yes, three distinct YouTube right. channels. And I post one video a week to each of them is my right. goal. And that, th those links are already in the show notes. So oh, I'm, I'm going to check out that video you. because I, I, I'm i very interested in spiralizers. Well, thank you so much. This has just been so informative. And that purple vegetable is like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah, my purple Mizuna. I love that. I just, I mean, I don't even want to eat it. I just want to have it just to look at. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing with the garden is like you could, you're unlimited in, in varieties. There's like, I don't even know how many thousand kinds of plants. And if you go to the grocery store, you got to buy what they sell. But if you grow food, you can source any seeds, you can source any plant starts. You could grow them in your garden to have, you know, higher quality, better tasting, prettier food. <laughs> than so, money somebody's commenting, this was super fun. John never sleeps. Is that true? Oh, I slept good last night. <laughs> when if I'm on, I'm on though. But otherwise, like at night, I'm out, man. I, I sleep 
I actually have a video on my OK Raw channel about 10 different gadgets I use to sleep better because sleep is super important for our health. And, you know, we, we, we need to not forget that. We need to have good restful sleep. I, you know, sleeping in complete darkness. I have red lights, you know, yeah. Weighted blanket. I mean, that's helped me so much. Oh my you're, gosh. You, you're like the vegan QVC, <laughs> you know? Well, you don't need all these products. Right. <laughs> but... hey, so can I, I want to start growing purslane because it, it, they, they don't sell it at the regular store, just at the ethnic markets. Can I, can I grow it inside or does it have to grow outside? Good question. I think, I mean, so for me purslane, how I grow purslane is I don't. <laughs> it just comes up in my garden. So it comes up, you know, we got to match the cycle. So it comes up in the springtime. So I'll plant my pepper plants, like my little baby pepper plant starts in like usually April and usually by May, the purslane is like, just comes out on its own as a weed. So what I'd recommend for you, AJ, is just, you want to buy some purslane seeds and there's all kinds of purslane. There's like weedy purslane, which is the kind you find in nature that has small leaves, but then they have like um, kinds of purslane that have nice large leaves. So you can get a more cultivated purslane with nice large leaves. You want to buy like the seeds in bulk, go to like johnnyseeds.com or something. My purslane seed, like buy like a whole, like an eighth of an ounce or an ounce or whatever. You'll have tons of seeds and then take the seeds, go to your backyard and freaking throw them everywhere in your backyard, right? And then you're going to pay the price because even in the desert, right? In the right time of year, that's the key in the right time of year. So it'd be probably like in the desert, it'll probably be about, you know, pretty much uh, between March and May, they'll just start to grow automatically. And then you'll have more purslane than you know what to do with. Wow. So, so we don't really seem to have dirt in our yard. It's just like sand. The purslane will grow in sand, but it's even better, AJ, is to, you know, get a little garden growing yourself and um, put a raised bed and then put this purslane seeds out there because those, those are a weed and you, you really don't need to do much. Right. But they're, they're supposedly long. like the highest source of omega-3 fatty acids in, in a green. In a green. Yeah. All greens have omega-3 fatty acids. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a more fleshy green. Um, you know, I would encourage everybody to eat many types of greens because as much as purslane is good for omega-3s, you know, other greens have other benefits. Um, but yeah, purslane is amazing. I love the texture and the stalks. Even the little stalks and the stems are edible. They're nice and chewy water-filled re reservoirs. I like to eat them. Yeah. Um, I think indoors, I don't, I don't know, like you'd have to provide like nice heated yeah. area for them. And some things just don't grow well indoors. I mean, they just want to live in the cracks of the garden where there's no soil and it's just sand and maybe just a little bit of water to germinate. Well, if you ever go visit Doug Evans, I'm really close to him. So visit me and maybe you can help me get my purslane garden growing. I love to do that. Actually, it's on my, it's on my uh, list to do to visit Doug because I want to make some really good videos with him about sprouting and, and what he's doing out there in the desert. Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> People are asking, do you just eat it from the garden or do you wash it? So it depends. So I have a garden in Northern California where generally I just pick things and eat it because, you know, there's not a whole lot of plains or, you know, pollution in that climate, but in this climate in Las Vegas, I'm like literally in the city and I see planes and helicopters flying over all the time. I'm a bit more paranoid about, you know, whatever chemicals. So like I wash pretty much 95% of everything in this garden that I eat. So I think it depends on your location. I, I hate blanket statements like always do this or always do that. Like each person needs to determine like what you think would you would feel comfortable with. For me, like if, it, if, if I didn't have any planes and all these things flying overhead and all the pollution flying and drifting into my garden, I would totally eat things unwashed. But because I know this has a good microbiome and I've created that, but because of all the, I don't want the, the chemicals that, are, that I'm not putting on my plants are just landing here from, you know, the, the toxic environment that we all live in, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that's great. I just saw a nice comment. Darius says, love John, have followed him for years. So great. Well, he'll be back. So thank you so much. It's always fun seeing what you're up to. Yes, AJ, thanks for having me. And hope I've encouraged a few people at least to start growing some more greens or other foods in your own yard so you guys can have better quality food than the grocery store okay. and more I, I was going to let you go, but then Melanie just typed, can you ask him why he likes a weighted blanket? Who would they be good for? So, I mean, you could do the research on the weighted blankets, but to me, like the weighted blankets, I just sleep a lot better because I just, it's like, it's like, okay, so they have these like things for dogs, like I guess uh, thunder vests or something for dogs that like coddle them. So then they're not as uptight and, and cranky and like barky or yappy or whatever. 
but also too, as children, you know, we're all being held and coddled. And so when I use a weighted blanket, it just feels, I feel more secure. So like my body could just be more at ease and I can maybe get deeper sleep, but I've really come to, to love that. And they do have, there, there's some science on that. So, you know, they, they recommend don't getting a weighted blanket more than um, 10% of your body weight. Cause you know, you don't want to suffocate. I've never been, I mean, I'm still here today, so I haven't been suffocated yet, but um, but to me, I just feel really comfortable with it. It just, I think it helps me get a deeper quality sleep. I mean, maybe if you, but I'm also single. So maybe if you have a nice, a nice person to sleep with and they're just coddling you all night, maybe you wouldn't need a weighted blanket. <laughs> what, what temperature do you keep the inside of your home at? So in the wintertime, actually, I try not to even use the heater. So, you know, I layer up with thermals and then actually, at, it, it, so the other thing I use at night is, is called, a, um, what is it called? Anyways, it's a, it's, a, it's a mattress pad that has water running through it um, that, that either heats up or cools down. So in the summertime, it's essential to cool down. Um, so I don't have to like use my whole house heater. And in the wintertime, I could heat it up. So like in the wintertime, I have that set at 75 degrees. So like I'm sleeping basically at 75 degrees like on my body um, because of the device I have to do that. Nice. And that's right. in my video I made on OK Raw. I talk about that. It's, 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 it's expensive, but it's one of the best things I ever bought for comfort and for savings of air conditioning in the summer and heating in the winter. Terrific. You know a lot about a lot. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Sleeping and eating and machines. Well, All right. Not health stuff anyways. Yep. About fashion, I have no clue, but this stuff, I mean, that's my life. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, continued good health and success to you. Thanks so much, John. All right, AJ. Thanks for having me. Take care. And thanks all Bye. of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guests are Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Jen Hawk for the monthly Q&A. Get your questions in in advance. And John, we look forward to seeing you back in April. Take